Hi, my name is Ilya Klausner. I'm from the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research, and I'm going to be chairing today's session on young people and um, in the criminal justice um, system, I guess. And I guess um, Jason gave more of an introduction than I ever could to young people. So I guess let's just get started. And our first presenta presentation is Youth Offending During the COVID-19 Pandemic, a case study from New South Wales by Cameron T. Langfield. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Cameron. I'm, I'll just make it at the outset. I'm Jason Payne's PhD student. Don't hold that against me. Um, any errors that you see in the presentation are entirely his. Um, no, I'm not <laughs> kidding, kidding, all in jest, all in jest. Um, so, obviously, first I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, um, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here, who are here today. Um, and I also want to thank, obviously, Boxar for organising the conference. Um, it's a great forum for PhD students like myself um, to familiarise the audience that I hope to influence later on in my career, um, to familiarise your, yourselves with some of my ideas. Um, and some of my research. Um, so my presentation today is obviously on youth offending during COVID. Um, Jason has obviously spooked this session as, <laughs> as an important one to be at. Um, hopefully you find it um, informative and hopefully you find you take away something from it. Um, so in this presentation, I'm just presenting some preliminary finding. Um, just a warning, there's no sophisticated stats. Um, I'm showing four tables and three graphs. Um, so hopefully it's not too overwhelming for the second uh, for the afternoon of the second day of the conference. Um, but yeah, I'm just providing some preliminary findings on two very basic questions: um, whether the prevalence of offending among a cohort of young people declined during the COVID-19 pandemic, and whether the frequency of their offending also declined um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So just some background, and I'm just going to rush straight through this. Um, Obviously, uh, research uh, during COVID has proliferated. Um, it's kept us criminologists very busy. Um, it seems that every uh, man and his dog has an opinion on what happened during COVID. Um, but just some uh, basic research, or not basic research, but just some uh, high level uh, insights. Obviously, in North America, property crime, including breaking in, a declined um, up to about 37% during their lockdown. Um, there is some debate about whether domestic violence increased, um, and I'm not going to be focusing on domestic violence too much in that, but I just want to say there's, there is some debate about whether it increased. Um, it's been called the dual pandemic or the twin pandemic. Um, research from Europe finds much the same thing. Um, crime, crime declined by about 41%, and similar results were obviously observed um, in the UK, but also Sweden, where large declines in assault and pickpocketing, and also in the Netherlands. Uh, Chinese research also found that uh, retail theft declined by about 64%, um, and also further declines were also noted by Shannon colleagues, and they documented, um, interestingly, an increase in cyber-related cyber offending, um, suggesting that offenders are potentially uh, resourceful um, in their offending and they find other ways to do the bad stuff that we want them to stop. Closer to home, um, Queensland analysis showed marked declines in common um, a serious and sexual assault. Um, property, uh, property crime also declined. Uh, work that I conducted with um, Professor Payne and uh, Professor Tony Mackay, um, we found that drug offences increased in Queensland during the three-month lockdown in 2020. Um, and then in New South Wales, there was two studies that focused on um, crime during the pandemic. Um, one was by Kim and Luang uh, and by Wang and colleagues out of Boxer, um, and they showed that New South Wales crime declined by about the magnitude of 632 fewer offences per week during the lockdown. Uh, so that's research that has really focused on um, adult offending during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, my research is on youth crime, um, and so I just wanted to flag these four studies. Obviously, there's a few more studies that have uh, come out, um, but these are four that um, really, I suppose, highlight some of the work that's been done in that space. It's a, a severely under-researched space, I think. Um, but the one I really just wanted to highlight was the MacArthur and colleague, uh, McCarthy and colleagues. Um, they found declines in youth property offending, declines in offences against the person, and also public order offences. They found no change in drug offences among, amongst youth offending, um, which was a bit contrary to what we found in Queensland. Um, but we weren't focused on necessarily youth offending, we were focused on drug offending more generally. Um, so that's just really the, the broad consensus is that most places around the world for most crime types, 
there was a decline. Um, and it seems that there was at least some decline amongst youth offenders, but also uh, most, uh, mostly amongst adult offenders, or that's probably just a, a basis for the research that we have so far. So the current study, as I said, forms my PhD thesis, um, which I'm hoping to submit by June of next year. Um, whether that happens is a matter entirely for myself, I guess. Um, but here we use officially recorded data, um, unit record data from uh, Boxar's Rod, um, so the reoffending database, um, to document to what extent the pandemic has affected youth offending patterns. Specifically, these data uh, for those individuals recorded in Rod as having a birth year of 2004. Caveat to this, it's not the same cohort as Jason's uh, presentation earlier. So there are more people in my data than the 244 or 254 people that he was talking about. Um, but this cohort was selected because they were entering a period of late adolescence, adolescence which from decades of criminological research we know um, is a peak time for offending. Um, we often know that young people do a lot more stuff um, and they tend, they tend to do it around the, the 14 to, to 18 year olds. Um, and so they were selected because they were entering into that period of what I call late adolescence. To enable comparison, however, we probably needed a control group, but as you can probably all appreciate, the COVID-19 pandemic was global, um, and albeit to uh, differing extents, there was some, uh, there was impact across the globe, so finding a comparison group was difficult. Um, but we also asked uh, Boxer, in lieu of having a true comparison group, to extract uh, records for individuals in Rod as having recorded a birth year of 2002 and 2000. Um, and I'm just gonna step you through a little bit about the methodology that we used um, to enable comparison between those three. And it is meant to be blank for a reason, so don't stress. So in 2004, this is obviously, we have data or I have data from the ages of 10 to 18. I've censored it to the end of um, their, well here, the 17th year, um, which was 2021. Um, because that was uh, essentially where the data became, uh, was more reliable to the end of uh, 2021. Um, and obviously COVID hit when they were 16 or turning 16 and continued on um, until they were 17. In the 2002 cohort, COVID at an, at an equivalent period in their trajectory would have hit at the same time, but obviously it hit when they were 18, 19. And then again for the 2000 cohort, it hit when they were 20, uh, turning 20 and then 21. Um, so to enable comparison, I essentially um, took what I consider a little bit of a, I guess, novel approach, and I don't mean that in an egotistical way, um, but I essentially took, as an example, um, an offence committed on January 1st, 2014 from the 2004 cohort under my accounting rules or under my methodology would stay where it is. So obviously that's our baseline. That's when they could start offending because under um, the age of criminal responsibility in Australia, that's when they would have turned 10 or when they would have started to turn 10. The 2002 cohort could start offending or could be recorded to be offending from 2012 onwards. And then from the 2000 uh, cohort, they could start uh, committing or start being charged for offences from 2010 onwards. In order to enable comparison, I essentially added two years to every offence date for the 2002 cohort and four years for every offence date for the 2000 cohort. So essentially, we have an equalised data set. I'm not sure that's the right word. I welcome any suggestions on what word is better. But we essentially have an equalised data set where all of our offenders are now offending at the same time. And I put same time in inverted commas because it's not truly the same time, but it's essentially we've pushed all the offences forward two and four years respectively. So their, their criminal trajectories or their criminal histories start at the same time. So all of these offences now start on the 1st of January 2014. That also means that some of the offences in the 2002 cohort and the 2000 cohort no longer exist in my data because I've censored it at the 31st of December 2021. Um, but that doesn't really matter because those are offences that were committed obviously after that date. So this is essentially what I've done. I've essentially said, okay, we're going to treat all of our cohorts as if they were born in 2004. And we're going to say, okay, what happened amongst the 2004 cohort um, at ages 16 to 17? And, ha and does that change um, from the cohorts that were uh, the, roughly the same age or at the same age of their, um, their equivalent trajectories? Um, and that's why I put COVID-19 in inverted commas, because it didn't actually happen when they were 16, 17. So I previewed before the first question that we're going to ask is whether the prevalence, so the number of offenders, um, so did the prevalence of offending change post-COVID? And perhaps no surprise to anybody in the room, it did. So on the, le on the left side of this screen, or your left, 
um, is the monthly prevalence of offending. Um, and along the bottom, you'll see that there's a whole lot of numbers that probably don't make a lot of sense. This is essentially 30-day uh, in, uh, intervals um, from back, if you read it from, um, from the black dotted line backwards or leftways. Um, it's 30-day increments backwards from the March 22nd of 2020, which is the day before COVID restrictions were introduced in New South, New South Wales. And then the same, it's 30-day increments from March uh, 23rd all the way to the 31st of December 2021. Now, perhaps the, the biggest thing or the, the, the most remarkable thing you can probably see in this is past the black dotted line, the very black line on the monthly prevalence chart is the 2004 cohort. Um, and there's a marked drop, right? We can all see that. It's a huge drop. It, about, it equates to about a 56% decline month on month. Um, but we can also see that post that point, there's a, a sharp uptick again, um, and then a series of, of peaks and troughs um, from there for. Um, the second peak or the third peak, um, or the second peak from the, the black line, um, and then you've got the, the trailing downwards. That's really the second New South Wales lockdown at the end of 2021, which went from uh, July to uh, October. Um, so that explains that. The cumulative prevalence of offending, um, again, shows a, a shallowing. Uh, just here you can see there's a bit of a shallowing post, uh, post the, the introduction of COVID restrictions. Um, but that shallowing, although it does stay lower than the other two cohorts, to the 31st of December, about 1 in 10 uh, people in the 2004 birth cohort had had contact with police. Um, so again, quite a marked difference to uh, Jason's presentation before. Um, and again, all errors are his. This uh, table is the one of the first four of first of the four tables that I'm going to show you. This is the uh, population prevalence of offending pre-COVID. Um, I wanted to put a title on this graph, but I, <laughs> it just wouldn't fit. Um, so this is the pre uh, pre-pandemic period. Um, if we're looking at the compared to the 2002 cohort, which was born two, thousand, uh, two years prior, um, you can see that there's obviously a 3% increase in the prevalence of, of violent offending, um, and that was primarily uh, born out in assault and robbery. Um, the robbery offending is really a small number, um, so look at the numbers and also look at the percentage changes, um, because obviously small numbers can lead to large percentage, in, uh, percentage increases. Um, other things that increased were vehicle theft, again, uh, an increase of about nine, um, and then drug offences and also disorder offences. And compared to the 2000 cohort, um, there was a 2% increase in the prevalence of offending pre-COVID. If we now look at post-COVID, you can see that there's... Uh, some changes still, less extent. Um, so violent offending only increased 2%, with assault offending increasing 4%. The largest increase, without a doubt, amongst the 2004 cohort compared to either of the cohorts before it was for public health offending, uh, which is this right down the bottom. It increased 6,743% on the 2000 cohort and 5,364% on the 2002 cohort. Now, I have to caution you, obviously look at the numbers here. There was four offenders in the 2004 cohort that was charged with that offence, um, and seven offend oh, sorry, five offenders in the 2002 cohort, and there was 271 offenders in the 2004 cohort. Um, so we're, we're going from a small baseline, but it is an extraordinary increase. Um, so much so that more offenders in the 2004 cohort were having contact with police for a public health offence than either of the two cohorts before it, which I think is quite an extraordinary finding. So now that we've discussed that the prevalence of offending um, declined um, post-COVID, um, and if I can go back, yeah, post-COVID overall it declined 12% um, compared to the 2002 cohort and 25% compared to the 2000, uh, 2000 cohort. Did the number of offences change post-COVID? And again, I hate to surprise you, but there really was no change. So this is uh, obviously the, the rate of offending um, in a graph. This is the last graph that I'll show you, so you can all relax. Um, but post-COVID, uh, which is the black dotted line, you can essentially see there was a, a drop, um, followed by some peaks and troughs. And then in the, in the later half of the series, which is really this section here, that was the second New South Wales lockdown. So it appears, at least on this, and I haven't done the statistical test to test this, but at least uh, on visual ins inspection, it seems that the second lockdown in New South Wales had a larger impact than the national lockdown. Um, and I challenge you to think potentially why that might be um, and thinking about the disproportionate uh, use of, let's say, curfews in Western Sydney. This is the number of offences uh, pre-COVID. Um, so you can see a lot of red um, in both of these columns. 
Um, but essentially, violent offending, this is the change in number and the change in rate. Um, violent offending compared to the 2002 cohort increased um, by about 1%, um, and robbery uh, increased by about 57 offences, which equated to about a 31% change in the rate per 100,000 among the 2004 cohort. Um, Public health offending pre-COVID was quite interesting. It had already started to, to uptick, but again, we're talking about here relatively small numbers. We're going from 27 to 29 um, offences. So we're talking about the change of two offences, so obviously a large number, um, or small number meeting a large uh, increase. And this is the last table that I will show you. Um, compared to the table before it, you can only see in the 2002 cohort, there's two lines that have been um, bolded in red. Um, that's vehicle theft which increased by 27 offences, or 7% uh, change in the rate per 100,000. And then in the uh, uh, public health offences, they increased 734 compared to the 2002 cohort, or an increase of about 97% in the rate per 100,000. Um, you compare that to the 2000 cohort, and you've got 12, 000, a 12,000% increase, but remember, we're talking about small numbers here, um, and that increased by about a, a 752. So obviously, we have a cohort of young people who are having contact with police more often for public health offences post-COVID um, compared to the 2000 and the 2002 cohort. Um, and again, I challenge you to think perhaps why that is. So what can we take away from this? Well, obviously, the takeaway message from, from these data um, is that the COVID-19 pandemic did actually have some impact. I say that as if we were expecting it not to have an impact. Um, I don't think anyone in this room is, uh, was of the view that the COVID-19 pandemic would not have an impact. Um, but we saw a 12% decline in the frequency of offenders, or the frequency, uh, the, sorry, the prevalence of offenders, um, and these are compared to the 2000 co uh, 2002 cohort, and we saw a decline of uh, 3,661 offences, or which was a decline of 28% in the frequency of offending among the 2004 cohort. Um, so these impacts obviously were clustered in violent or uh, assault um, and property offences and stealing, um, and may have arisen obviously because strict lockdown conditions um, prevented people from going out, right? Um, and because fewer people um, were frequenting places where these offences were, were likely to take place, such as pubs, bars and shops. Um, assault, we know in Australia, is you know, more likely to happen around um, bars and clubs, for example, um, and property offending, which is more likely to happen um, in, in and around shops, um, which were closed during both the national but also the New South Wales state lockdown. However, and this is probably the most uh, important takeaway um, from today, of all the increases in both population prevalence and the frequency of offending among the 2004 cohort, public health offending, um, which was coded under, I think, Code 16, which is miscellaneous offences in the ANZOC code, um, increased dr dramatically. Right? We, can't, we can't shy away from the fact that more kids in 2004 were having contact with police. Um, and you do have to question at least a little bit under, um, and I don't want to get into criminological theory, um, but you do have to question a little bit under uh, labelling theory and the such, that if more kids are having contact with police um, for a specific offence, will they go on to have more contact um, later in life through an, an issue of ensnarement, et cetera, and so forth? Um, but preliminary data from uh, preliminary analysis that I conducted um, for the purposes of this presentation showed that actually the majority of young people um, charged with a public health offence didn't go on to have further contact. Um, so 2000, uh, 271 offenders in the 2004 cohort were charged with a public health offence as their first offence. Um, of these, 223, or 82%, only committed one offence, which was the public health offence, up to the date of extraction, which was uh, June 30th, 2022. 48% um, uh, 48 offenders, or 19%, did go on to commit further offences, um, with 36% of, of offenders, uh, 36 offenders committing one further offence, and 12 offenders committing between three and 10 further offences. Um, so obviously this analysis, that preliminary analysis that I've just told you, um, is limited by the short period of follow-up time. We're really only talking here about six months after the New South Wales lockdown had finished, when, when I extracted the data from Boxer, or Boxer provided me the data. Um, it suggests, at least, that the vast majority of young people um, charged with a public health offence did not go on um, to commit more offences, which I think is a good news story that we can all take away and feel a bit fuzzy and warm about. Um, Although I'm not presenting it today, the next stage of analysis, I plan on um, analysing these results by geographical location and gender, um, and particularly exploiting um, potentially the, the um, police area of command. Um, and my hypothesis would be that 
um, I asked you before to think a little bit about the um, Western Sydney um, lockdown that was potentially harsher um, than the rest of New South Wales. Um, I expect that areas under stricter lockdown conditions um, would have larger declines in both the frequency and prevalence. Um, but I suspect or I hypothesise that potentially the increase in public health offences that we saw overall in the aggregate data would cluster in some of those places, potentially. Um, so yes, and I think that's, I think I'm running well ahead of time, so I think we're fine. I'll end it there. Thank you so much. <laughs>
bars and clubs and offending or not offending. Yeah, no, it's a good point. It is a very good point. And again, I think that's probably why uh, that sort of supposition or uh, that uh, that assumption um, <laughs> it needs to be a little bit more empirically tested. Um, but yes, hopefully the the smallest unit the smallest unit of analysis that I have in the Boxar data um, is uh, SA four, um, which probably means nothing to anybody. Um, but essentially, it's it's the smallest smallest place that I can get to. Um, but I also, so that's really um, one, I, I suppose in that locality research or that locality um, arm of the, the research, um, I'll use other sources um, about the density of bars, clubs, et cetera, and so forth, um, and then map potentially the incidence of crime in and around those areas um, as best I can. It won't be perfect, um, but yes, no, I'm definitely hoping to try and yeah, use multiple sources to try and figure out whether that proposition is actually correct. Thank you. No and, and can I ask another question? Yeah, of course you can. Um, <laughs> just interested in the difference between your, the experience of young people in New South Wales, yeah. um, Victoria, where they had some pretty sure. horrific um, lockdown mm. sp um, things, and then maybe Western Australia and Queensland where yeah. we had far less lockdowns. Yeah. Is there any thought about doing some more research? Get, yeah, uh, so very good question. Um, it's obviously hindered by data data access. Um, so New South Wales, we're very fortunate that Boxar provides unit, unit record data. Um, we did have I did have this grand thought at the very beginning of my PhD that I would use uh, data from three states, um, such as Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria, um, because they had very different um, very different experiences of the COVID lockdowns. Um, and obviously Victoria was far, far and away, you know, the most uh, lockdown state. Um, but it's getting access to the, the type of data that you'll need to answer those questions. Um, and yeah, and I, yeah, I just don't know whether Victoria and Queensland are, are open to, <laughs> to sharing that data. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you very much. Sorry, can I just quickly add? Uh, oh, Karen? yes. Yeah. Um, Gosh. I wonder Lesson if they, learned. Don't end the presentation early. <laughs> <laughs> just building on Sally's point. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it... it could also be premises type, right? For sure. So schools are closed exactly. for a long period of time. Yeah. We know violence happens there. We know violence happens outside the exactly. school grounds. Yeah. So rather than necessarily looking at SA4, you could look at changes in, in premises type. I yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I suspect changes. that, yeah, most, yeah. At, at the ages that we're talking about, most violence is probably happening at the, the school level. Yeah. I think that's all. Wonderful. Yes. I guess we have time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> now you're just milking uh, it. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Cameron. <laughs>